Hi, I'm Avrami Canal, and I'm an assistant professor of hospital medicine at UCSF. This talk is intended for non-hospitalists and non-internists, and is part of a series from the Division of Hospital Medicine called Five Minute Hospitalist. As an overview, we'll start out by discussing normal acid-base physiology and introduce the four major acid-base disorders. We'll learn the components of an ABG and learn how to interpret them in our three steps. And we'll finish by going through a case together. And finally, you'll have a PDF take home of all the equations and numbers that I provided here, which you can access from the QR code below. Acid-base balance in the body is carefully maintained through the balance of these two chemicals, carbon dioxide on the left, the main acid in the body, which is mostly handled by the lungs, and bicarbonate on the right, the main base in the body, which is mostly handled by the kidneys. Next, we'll explore the four major derangements in acid-base physiology, starting with respiratory acidosis, when there's too much carbon dioxide in the blood. It becomes more acidic and the pH drops. When there's too little carbon dioxide in the blood, we call that respiratory alkalosis, and the blood is less acidic. On the flip side, bicarbonate level, when it's too high, causes metabolic alkalosis, and when it's low, causes metabolic acidosis. Our next step in understanding normal acid-base physiology is to explore the ways in which the body responds to these major derangements. So in metabolic acidosis, we know the issue is low bicarbonate. The body will respond by breathing faster, lowering the carbon dioxide level, trying to bring that pH back up toward 7.4. In metabolic alkalosis, when there's too much bicarbonate around, the body will respond by breathing slower, raising the carbon dioxide and dropping the pH close to normal. The same occurs in the respiratory conditions, except in this time, it's the kidneys that respond by either retaining or excreting bicarbonate to return the pH to near normal levels. When we think about the way in which bicarbonate and carbon dioxide interplay, it's important to realize that compensation occurs in the same direction. So as bicarbonate level drops in metabolic acidosis, we expect that carbon dioxide also drops. And as carbon dioxide rises in respiratory acidosis, we expect that bicarbonate will rise as well. Let's continue now by exploring each of these disorders in detail, starting with metabolic acidosis. The most common of these acid-based disorders you're likely to encounter in the hospital medicine setting. This can be thought of in two major buckets. On the right, too much of an acid is called anion gap metabolic acidosis. And this is because there's an anion in the blood that's unaccounted for. On the left, too little bicarbonate around falls in the bucket of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Some of the common etiologies for these two buckets are listed here. Anion gap metabolic acidosis is typically due to lactic acid, keto acids, or uric acid in acute or chronic renal failure. Non-anion gap metabolic acidosis is typically due to loss of bicarbonate, either through the gut or the kidneys. Metabolic alkalosis can also be thought of in two major buckets, either too much bicarbonate or loss of an acid. The latter typically occurs in the hospital medicine setting through gastric acid loss, either through vomiting or nasogastric suction, whereas too much bicarbonate rarely occurs from intake of bicarbonate more commonly occurs because of kidney resorption of bicarbonate, either in response to hypovolemia or diuretics. Moving on to our respiratory disorders, we see that respiratory acidosis is the result of hypoventilation of one form or another. Respiratory alkalosis is the result of hyperventilation when too much CO2 is being exhaled. Next, let's explore the components of a typical ABG, and you'll see here the notation that's typically used to write these out. First is the pH, which has no unit, followed by the partial pressures of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood. These are listed in millimeters mercury because they're gases dissolved in liquid. 
Next is the bicarbonate level in the blood, which is written in concentration, mole equivalents per liter, and the oxygen saturation, which is the same as you might get from a pulse oximeter on your finger. Here you'll find the typical normal values for each of these. You won't have to memorize these because I provided them for you in our one page take home at the end. Now let's look into the steps required to interpret an ABG. We'll start by using the pH to determine whether the blood is acetemic or alkalemic. And then we'll use the carbon dioxide and bicarbonate levels to determine whether the primary issue is respiratory or metabolic. And we'll use some calculations to determine whether the body responded appropriately to that primary insult. Our first step is the most simple and it includes looking at the pH. If the value is below 7.35, you have an acidemia. If it's greater than 7.45, you have an alkalemia. Once we've determined whether the blood is acidemic or alkalemic, we'll then look at the bicarbonate and carbon dioxide levels to determine whether the primary issue was respiratory or metabolic. For example, if you see that the blood is alkalemic, well, you would expect a metabolic alkalosis to show a high carbon dioxide and a high bicarbonate. If it were a respiratory alkalosis, you'd expect a low carbon dioxide and a low bicarbonate. And the same would go for our acidemias. Our next and final step is to determine whether the body responded appropriately and sufficiently to the initial acid-base derangement. Remember that those responses will occur in the same direction as the primary insult. Let's quantify this relationship between bicarbonate and carbon dioxide. I focused here on our two most common acid-base derangements that you're likely to encounter in a hospital medicine setting. Starting with metabolic acidosis, you can see that for every one mil equivalent decrease in bicarbonate, we expect our carbon dioxide to decrease by 1.2 millimeters of mercury. And in respiratory acidosis, for every one millimeter of mercury increase in carbon dioxide, we expect our bicarbonate to increase by 0.1 to 0.4 mil equivalents per liter. Here we see those relationships depicted mathematically. So for metabolic acidosis, we can calculate our expected compensatory drop in carbon dioxide by multiplying our actual drop in bicarbonate by 1.2. Now you'll see that I've split respiratory acidosis into two conditions based on chronicity. This is because while the lungs are very quick to respond to changes in bicarbonate level, the kidneys are actually quite slow to respond to changes in carbon dioxide taking up to three to five days to respond fully. So in the acute setting, we can expect that the bicarbonate level would rise minimally, only 0.1 of our rise in carbon dioxide. In chronic respiratory acidosis, in the matter of three to five days, our kidneys will start to retain bicarbonate, giving us a ratio of about one to 0.4. Let's consolidate our knowledge by going through this case. Here, a 64-year-old man without significant medical history is admitted with three days of fever and cough. He's found to be hypotensive with acute kidney injury, a lactate of four and a half, and a bicarb level of 14. His ABG shows a pH of 7.21, CO2 of 32. Let's use our three steps to determine which acid-base disturbances are occurring here, keeping an eye on our normal values to the right. Our first step is to determine whether his blood is acidemic or alkalemic. In this case, it's acidemic since his pH is less than 7.35. Next, we'll have to determine whether the primary issue here is a respiratory or metabolic one. Remember to look at the level of carbon dioxide and bicarbonate here to determine that. In this case, he has a metabolic acidosis. 
We know this because both his bicarbonate and carbon dioxide levels are low. If you're not so sure about this, take a look at the table on the last slide to refresh your memory. Finally, we'll have to determine whether the body responded appropriately in adjusting the carbon dioxide level in response to the drop in bicarbonate. To do this, we'll use our equation for metabolic acidosis. We'll start by calculating our primary derangement, our drop in bicarbonate, down from our normal level of 24 to 14. Multiplying that by 1.2, we see that our expected drop in carbon dioxide is 12, bringing us to an expected final carbon dioxide of 28, down from 40. Now, what should we do about the fact that our patient's carbon dioxide level is higher than would be expected based on compensation for the metabolic acidosis alone. Well, this brings us to the reason that we perform these comp compensation calculations altogether, which is to determine whether a secondary acid-based disturbance is going on. And in fact, in this case, there is. And we know anytime there's too much carbon dioxide in the blood, that's a respiratory acidosis, and that's what he has. So now to put together our interpretation of his ABG, we would say that this patient has a metabolic acidosis, likely an anion gap metabolic acidosis from lactate, but he also has a respiratory acidosis since his carbon dioxide was higher than we would have expected just from compensation. Our next steps clinically would be to explore, find the reason and treat his suspected sepsis and treat his lactic acidosis accordingly. I hope you've enjoyed this short talk on ABG interpretation. Feel free to use the QR code on the bottom to take home this one pager to help you interpret your next ABG. Thank you.